Welcome everyone to Trading Fast and Slow, different references for different trader personalities. And it is Wednesday, April 26, 4.30 p.m. Eastern. This is the second webinar we've had today. We had a kickstart webinar that is now uploaded at YouTube and at the training site, a public page under webinars. Um, so if you did not attend, you're welcome to the video or the recording. And uh, it's great to see you all here. So thank you for coming out. Nice to have you. And um, this is our last public webinar in the Mastery Program series. So we thank all of you for attending and being a part of it, participating, excellent questions. Um, and it, it really enhances the presentation. So we appreciate that. And we want to thank you all. And we wish you well. And if you're going on to the Mastery Series, we will see you every day starting Monday. So um, thank you to everyone. And with that, I think I've said it all. I did drag the slides. They're pretty basic. Um, but of course, Jim will have much to say about each one. So if you cannot get them in the handout section, give me about 10 minutes and I will have them at jdaltontrading.com under webinars this webinar okay so just give me a few if you can't grab it from the handout section and I am going to stop talking and turn it over to Jim hey Jim hi thank you um, we're going to start we're not going to start with the slides we're going to start with something different um, simply because of what happened today and I, th I think most of you have an interest in the current uh, the current market so let me let me talk about something that we talked about during the kickstart series the kickstart series is a series of seven uh, webinars that we have done in order to bring people up to speed prior to the official start of the mastery series on Monday one of the things that I covered this afternoon in that final kickstart program was a discussion that there are basically two types of traders. The first type of trader is a momentum trader. Momentum trading is by far the most prevalent. It is by far the easiest. And because it's the most prevalent or because it's the easiest, it tracks the greatest amount of followers. Because it attracts the greatest amount of followers, it has more of a tendency to demonstrate what the herd effect is all about. So that's the one type of trade, the momentum, the momentum trading. Other type of trading I identified is what I call value trading. Value trading is what we engage in. And the reason we refer to it as value trading is that we start, we constantly talk about the market being a continuous two way auction process. We record the market's continuous two-way auction process via the market profile. The term value comes from how we look at the top 67 to 70% of volume that takes place on every day on a, on a profile. And when we do that, let me just let me just escape from here for a second. We'll bring a profile up, and this is the the blue area is what we consider to be value. So it's we are not talking about value in the sense you would talk about value if you were buying a car or a house. We are talking about value that you would see discovered if you went to a two-way auction process, for example. 
you and I might go into that auction process with totally different views of what the value of that art piece of art being auctioned was worth. The auctioneer will attempt to start the bidding, and let's say it's a pick a number, hundred thousand. Let's say so he will try and start the uh, the bidding at a hundred thousand. If no one will raise his bid at a hundred thousand, he's got to drop down to say ninety seven thousand, then finally ninety eight. So maybe at ninety six thousand, all of a sudden the bidding gets underway, and now the auction it goes up ninety six, ninety eight, ninety nine, back through a hundred, and let's say to a hundred and ten or whatever. So, but in that in that process, as price is going higher, two things can happen. One thing can happen is that you'll hear the auctioneer say new bidder. That tells you that higher prices are bringing in more activity. If you hear the auctioneer start to put in filler, who will give, who will give blah, blah, blah for this wonderful thing, putting in filler, trying to make the auction sound impressive, that tells you that the auction is slowing down. When we get all done, we've established the value for that piece of art at this, at this particular time. That is the value. It has nothing to do with what you thought it was worth or what somebody else thought it was worth. It really what was determined by the market. It is probably, when we use that in the marketplace, it is, in my opinion, the fairest way to distribute the many bids and offers backed by many different opinions that are flowing into the marketplace. When we get all done after looking at the range for the day, we then determine, we, we look and we say, okay, where was, you know, one standard deviation basically, one standard deviation determines the value. So we have value. So as value traders, that's what we're looking at each day. A price trader will see something entirely different. Differently. If the market opened down here and, and closed here, the price trader will have one idea. If it closed up here, probably have another idea. We're trying to settle on what do we think the value is at that point in time. So there's, we break this down, there's value traders, there's momentum traders. And I understand that's a little oversimplified, but I'm trying to use this as an example. Now, this leads into somewhat what we're seeing in today's market. And what we've seen for the past few days. Momentum traders or price traders. One of the re one of the ways to understand who is in the market. Momentum or price traders tend to be buyers at close to exact references. If you will look at, we gapped higher to start the week. The low on Monday was two ticks off of the overnight low. When I see that take place, that is normally an indication of a momentum trader. That's how momentum traders buy. They, they use very visual, very visual references and focus heavily on price. So when I see this, I say this looks to me like momentum trading. So it is a gap higher. We close not in the highs, but off of the uh, off of the of the low for the day. We then come around the following day, we gap higher again. We gap higher again, and another indication that we are looking at momentum trading 
is there is the pullback low the afternoon on Monday. Pullback low is the lowest the market trade at, trades, trades at. Sometime it makes a correction during the day. Notice that the overnight low is exactly at the pullback low from the afternoon. That's another indication that momentum or price-based traders were in the market. Let's, I'm going to separate out today. And you come in today, and the price-based traders are still active. There's unchanged. The red line is unchanged. They are buying just a little bit above unchanged. And they buy fairly heavily throughout the session. Value-based traders, like myself, see a great deal of risk in starting with Monday. That I have a poor low, which means it's it's it means there's no excess on the low. So there was no aggressive buying on the low. There was buying, but it wasn't aggressive. It's was probably by price based. The shape or the formation on Monday was not elongated, yet rather it was very truncated, which indicates to me that there wasn't any, there wasn't really any dominant participation in this market other than that of the price-based traders. Had I seen price-based traders plus value traders or new money traders, I probably would have had elongation. I come in yesterday and I see the same type of non-elongation in the market. Again, an indication that I have momentum traders pretty well isolated and having very little participation by the institutional trading environment. So I've got markets going higher on what appears to be price-based. Yes, we're establishing value higher, but it's very chunky, very constricted come in again today and let me collapse today and we get that kind of trading for the third day in a row when I look at this market and I see value I'm going to take the overnight out of here just to make this a little simpler to read When I come in today and I see these, this chunkiness of these markets and two gaps in a row, that tells me that I am pretty much looking at very emotional momentum type buying. I get a third type of similar structure today. Today was quite different. Prices were going higher. And value was, de was declining. I'm sorry. Price was going higher. Value was going higher. But volume was declining all day long. Higher prices, lower volume, declining volume is not a healthy sign to a value trader. Price should advertise opportunity. Time should regulate opportunities. And volume should measure the success or failure of the advertised opportunities. So as a value trader, I saw risk being extremely high today. The price-based or momentum trader wouldn't probably have seen the same thing. 
because prices were, you know, up all day and prices were just slightly below unchanged from yesterday. But I saw as a value, as a value player, I saw tremendous risk in the market. However, as a value trader, I am not going to fight momentum trading. I'm still going to trade with the daily auction and with value. But I'm still assessing the risk as being very high. The momentum trader, I'm guessing, doesn't see the same risk that a value trader sees. His price was basically unchanged. You know, by the time we settled tonight, we're only a couple ticks, only a couple ticks below yesterday. So now it will be interesting to see what happens coming in tomorrow. The pressure is going to be on the momentum traders to prove their position. Where I'm focusing on coming into tomorrow is the pullback low from yesterday. That was also the overnight low. And you'll see today's low, the late break, either the M period low prior to the last runoff was just a tick above this. With the runoff, we went a single tick below this pullback low, overnight low, and now today's low. So coming in tomorrow as a value trader, I see this as a very vulnerable area. If the market is weak, I would expect to see downward continuation tomorrow. If the market isn't that weak, the market trades higher tomorrow, or it looks down below this area and rallies. All right, this wasn't part of the scheduled presentation, but I wanted to, I wanted to take an opportunity to kind of spotlight what we teach, which is value trading, and what goes on with momentum trading. Now understand, as a value trader, we don't fight momentum, but we look at momentum differently. We're never going to stop in front. On, if you think of a long-term auction low, what happens with momentum trading because it's more subjected to the herd instinct, it tends to take prices lower than they probably ought to be. That momentum, that herd instinct comes in, drives it lower. When you get that, we want to be contrarians. We want to be buyers. As the market starts back up as a value trader, I want to be in sync with the momentum traders. As the market makes a high, I want to be a contrarian, and I want to be trading opposite of the momentum trading. I've described momentum trading a lot, like being able to go to a racetrack, a horse racetrack, and instead of, instead of being required to place your bet prior to the start of the race, we let you bet on the horse until the first horse crosses the finish line. If you have to bet on your horse prior to the race getting started, you have a, you have a money pool. That money pool is divided to, depending on how much is bet on the horses, and you get the odds, etc. but it's coming out of, the, out of the, the distribution of money in the betting in the pool. If, in fact, you allow the betting to go on until the horse crosses the finish line, what's going to happen, all of the money, or the majority of the money, is going to be tied to the one horse. It's, you know, just a couple feet from crossing the finish line. So at that point in time, the payoff is 
very small. You may win, but the payoff is small. Your risk is huge. If you get from just a couple foot from the finish line and your horse breaks its leg, you lost a lot of money and you had very little opportunity to make any money. Now that possibility, I don't know if it happened, but that possibility may have occurred today. I'm going to come over. I'm going to mark, based on the pro profile, the red line is the all-time high on the current June contract. Momentum buyers were frantically trying to get to the all-time high. They saw it was done on the NASDAQ yesterday. And the momentum traders are trying to do that. They didn't make it. So late in the day, there was liquidation by the momentum traders. Now, I didn't see, I didn't see liquidation. I saw, I'm sorry, I saw liquidation of existing positions. But I did not see any prominent new institutional money selling. So we don't know. Right now, it may have simply been a just a little inventory adjustment. Sometimes markets get too long to go any higher. And when they get too long to go any higher, we say sometimes a market has to break before it can rally. So one possibility is today the market had to break. It had to bring inventory back into balance. Once it gets inventory back in the balance, it replaces some of those weaker hands that were forced to liquidate with stronger hands, and now the market comes back and makes another attempt at the all-time high. Clearly a possibility. Now we will look, we're going to go over, and we're going to look at overall um, volume today. This is our trading site, and we use New York Stock Exchange volume as composite volume as the best source. Okay, so what you'll see, if you're looking, if, if I made this, I guess that's about as big as I can make this. Let me see. Okay, what you're looking at, early this morning, first 30-minute period, volume dried up by 8,000 contracts. You can see that Volume dried up all day long. With a half an hour left to go today, we were 523,000 um, contracts behind yesterday. By the close today, volume had exceeded yesterday with a total volume for the day of a little over $4 billion. So we had a tremendous amount of volume come in on the, on the, uh, the last uh, 30 minutes in the market today. Tremendous volume coming in. Now, whether that is just liquidation uh, and nothing to it or not, but we certainly want to be aware of that. So what we had today, higher prices were bringing in less volume. Lower prices that happened late in the day close that gap, and eventually exceeding the gap um, from yesterday. So we don't know the outcome. There's some strange things can happen on the close. Okay, now, I wanted to go, I wanted to go through and start with that presentation. Now, I want to go to with that, with that behind you, knowing that we see momentum traders, we see value traders, we are value traders, but we do not ignore momentum trading. Remember what I said, at, at market lows, we want to be contrary or contrarians to momentum trading. In the middle, 
as the, as the rally taking place, for example, we want to be with the momentum traders. And at the highs, we want to be contrarians again. Uh, so it gives you kind of an idea what I'm talking about. And you see the way that I saw prices going higher, the chunkiness of the profiles for the past three days, it appeared to me that momentum was far out in front of value. And we didn't look like we were getting new money coming into the market. Okay, so that's a setup. Now we'll, we'll see what happens tomorrow. So what are we going to look at? Let me go back and I'll, and I'll just answer what to look for for tomorrow and then we'll go on to the scheduled presentation. The pullback low from yesterday, the low from today, is my reference for tomorrow. I'm going to treat the area from today's low to today's high as a trading range. I'm going to treat it as an individual trading range. One of the things that we do each night, we come up and we have three, at a minimum, three potential scenarios for the following session. The reason we have at least three scenarios is that there are so many unexpected things that can take place in a market. You saw one yesterday. All of a sudden, there was a lot of floating again about, you know, a tax plan. And the market got all excited. So there's too many unexpected things that can take place in the market. So we want to always have three scenarios. So we have some idea of how to handle a day once it opens. The worst trading habit you can ever have is coming into a market with a single idea or opinion. Granted, if you're right, you will make a lot of money. But if you're wrong, you're stubborn, it will be very costly. Okay, so when we come into tomorrow, we're going to treat the range from yesterday's pullback low to today's low as a trading range. I'm going to call it a balanced trading range. We are going to apply balanced trading rules to that range. The balanced trading rules are as follows. Look above the balance and fail. Look above the balance, accelerate higher. Trade within the balance, which would suggest that you would have a rotational environment that day. Look below balance and fail. If you look below balance and fail, in other words, you try and trade lower, fail, auctions back up. The destination trade becomes the high of the balance area. Look below balance and accelerate lower. Now you have a downside breakout. In this case, the downside destination trade would be two steps. Step one would be the top of the gap at 23.77.50, followed by filling the gap at 23.74. So that's those are our scenarios for tomorrow. Okay. Now, with that said, let me go back now and talk about what our scheduled presentation for today was. I wanted to do the other because we're always trying to be relevant in what's going on in the market. The next thing we're going to talk about is also an attempt to be relevant in the market. One of the things we suggest to traders is that they identify what kind of a trader they are. Are they Fast traders, and fast traders, we say, that's in the market, in and out, very quickly, very nimble. This would be thought of as what traditionally was thought of as scalping. Scalping years ago was really referred to for floor traders. If the, if the market was 10 bid offered at a quarter, 
the scalper was trying to, you know, make the bid or the offer. So if a market was offered at uh, at uh, 10, he'd like to buy it at, at, at 10 and a quarter. He'd like to buy it at 10, sell it at 10 and a quarter. Sell it at 10 and a quarter, uh, buy it at, at 10. And that was the ideal scalper out there. As we went away from four trading and we got more and more to electronic trading, people started to, you know, uh, bastardize, if you will, this idea of scalping. A lot of traders came in, and it looked so easy to be scalpers, and that's what they thought they'd do. They'd take a few ticks here, a few ticks here, and it'd be very simple. Uh, very few people make money trying to be scalpers. The, the best knowledge that I have of those people that were scalpers or traders on the floor that tried to transition to uh, electronic trading off the floor about the highest estimate I get is about 5% of them, 5% of them make money. So it was a very hard transition. But scalping, I see scalping a little broader today. And I, I actually see scalping fairly closely tied into momentum trading. But the point is, and we'll get more specific here before we finish this presentation, it's the the trader that is a fast trader, and we're recommending that you read Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow. It's a great book. Kahneman is one of the best economists on behavioral economics, and very behavioral uh, characteristics are very important to trading. But fast thinking is the kind of thinking that we need to do to get up in the morning, walk down and have breakfast, uh, back the car out of the garage, you know, et cetera. Um, we, we do it very quickly. Slow thinking, slow thinking is we contemplate a little bit more. A little more time is spent, a little, care, a little more careful about what we do. Our fast instincts are so often based on intuition. One of the things we found that our intuition isn't as reliable as we think it is. But go and read Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. I think it will help you then decide what kind of a trader you are. So let me let me go forward for a second. And anybody that's listened to our webinars for a period of time knows what drive what will drive Jim crazy. Somebody will say, well, where do I buy it, where do I sell it, and where do I put my stop? And everybody knows that I don't know that answer, nor do I purport to know that answer. We can look at odds, but the question, uh, what I should do to that, is when I hear that question, is answering a question with a question. How annoying is it to, to you? somebody asks you a question and you answer their question with a question? It could be very annoying. But my question is somebody says, where do I get in? Where do I get out? Where do I put my stop? My question is going to be, what kind of a trader are you? Most people will look at me like, like I'm crazy. I say, I'm a trader. They have no idea what that really means. And like I say, my first category is if you're a fast trader, you're going to have trade in one characteristic. If you're a slow trader, you're going to have a totally different manner of trading. So I see, I see the two that we've talked about. Let's bring this discussion by life, looking at trading from yesterday in the E-mini. I think this will help us have a much clearer idea of what, I'm, what I am talking about. So we're going to go over to yesterday's e-mini. We're going to exp uh, no, I'm so yeah, I'm sorry, I gave you the wrong place. Going over to yesterday's e-mini. 
For right now, I'm just going to take out so we're not distracted by it. I'm going to take out today's trading. So yesterday, the market gaps higher. Large gap. Now we have rules for handling gaps. Our gap trading rules are as follows. Go with all gaps that aren't filled very quick, fairly quickly. In other words, go in the direction of the gap if the gap is not filled fairly quickly. If a gap is filled, fade it. In other words, if it's a higher gap, fade it. In other words, go with the short. But if value, as the day goes on, doesn't look like it's going to be at least overlapping, then the odds of a late day rally or a later day rally are very high. And the reason for that would be that value was higher. A buyer, one of the best buys if you get a gap higher, one of the best buys is where a market begins to trade off, tempo gets very slow, and it's not quite able to fill the gap. That's your best buy because you're able to go long if it's a gap to the upside, put your stop just a little back, bit back in the previous day, and you know your risk is is fairly minimal. Now for just a second I'm going to put the uh, overnight trade back in. Okay. The when we look at trading the overnight high and low are good short-term references. So yesterday, according to our gap rule, the market gaps higher, very little give back. It quickly gets accepted above, starts trading above the overnight high. That is a clear go with the gap trade. Conviction was fairly high from the opening. It only went down a couple ticks. Didn't take it long to get above uh, to get above the overnight high. Okay, that's what I call a slow trade. Now, some people may say, well, wait a minute, I was watching that market, and I was very much making fast decisions. I call it a slow trade. One, we already have rules in place for trading gaps. We know pretty much where the market's going to open. We're following the overnight market. And we can see that the overnight market, the market's going to gap higher, going to be a nice gap. Now we know some other information too. Some other information we know is that the bigger the gap, historically, a lot of these people that used to teach short-term trading to people would tell them to fade all gaps. And, and I heard that when I first was a, 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 had my jacket on the floor of the Chicago Board of Trade, you know, I had a guy walk up to me and say, you know, Jim, professional traders will normally fade all gaps. Well, you know, when you're a young guy and you think, oh, boy, well, I want to see myself as a professional trader, so I'm going to fade those gaps. Well, that was probably about the worst information I ever had once you're trading from upstairs. And I didn't, I didn't trade on the floor for only a, a very limited time. Uh, I used my membership uh, upstairs as a, an officer with uh, with Payne Weber. Uh, and then, uh, so it really wasn't, I wasn't a full-time trader down there. I was on the rules committee, but I, I wasn't one of those people making my living every day. But it always stuck in my mind. Fade, you know, a professional trader fades the gap. That's about the worst no information anybody can ever give you. You got to think about it. The bigger the gap, the greater the odds that the market will continue in the direction of the gap. 
And the reason for that is the dislocation. Anybody that's short is going to have to cover their shorts. And if they don't cover, their trading firm is probably going to force them to cover. And secondly, there's so much momentum or price-based trading with a large gap, the price-based systems, if it's the gap is to the upside, the price-based systems are more than likely going to turn positive. So we've got a lot of information. So it really is a slow trade when I go with this with this gap. Because I've thought about it. And I can, you know, I can talk about it for some period of time. So now the market does go higher. But one of the important things about that is think about how many traders came into yesterday's gap. And they're petrified. Oh my God! They can't buy something that's that's high. They 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 just want to short it. They want to short it. Oh my God! You know, if it was ten yesterday and I can sell it at eighteen today, God, what a great what a great chance! So you get that, you get that mentality. You get the fear, and they see that the price is so much higher. The price is so much higher. They intuitively equate that with risk. Okay, and that's just a bad concept in your mind. Risk occurs when you're going to go long and there's nobody underneath the market bidding with you. As long as there are bids underneath the market, there is no risk. One of the things I used to comment on the floor, you would get traders that were, you know, uh, two, three, four, five lot traders, and all of a sudden, when there was really strong bids to the market, the market was going higher. Some of these traders may become 10, 20, 30 lot traders for short periods of time because they understood the bids were coming into the market. There was no risk. So it's a totally, what I'm talking about is a total different way of thinking about what risk is about. Risk isn't what your mind tells you. Oh, risk is because I'm so much higher. I'm, if this was about nine handles higher, than the previous several, they say, oh my golly, that's too much risk. I can't do that. If you really understand markets and you're a slow trader, you can think about things, you don't have any risk as long as the bids are there. And when there's no give back here and you easily get above the overnight high, guess what? The bidding is there and your risk, at least at this point, is minimal. Now, the market trades higher. So this is the trade, this early trade is the trade of a slow thinker. Now we're going to go back and we're going to talk about the mentality of a fast, well I'm sorry, not a slow thinker, a slow trader up here. Now we're going to go back and we're going to talk about the characteristics of a fast trader. A fast trader is somebody that is very nimble. They don't fall in love with, with trades, but there's a clear distinction between the personality of a slow trader and the personality of a fast trader. The fast trader is very callous, doesn't, doesn't hold positions either right or wrong, buys something and he's in it for a very short period of time. You have an inside bar and C period. D period comes down to the B period low. No follow through. This is a fast thinker's paradise. That fast thinker's buying that market. And if it goes a couple ticks below here, he's out. But make a little run to the upside, also out of the trade. That's a fast thinker. They're looking very short trade. This is the replacement for what a scalper was years ago. In G period. The market finally stopped. It had been one time framing all of these periods. It takes two ticks to stop one time framing in G period. Stop one time framing. Market broke. It got two ticks below the BD low, came back in. That, again, is a fast thinker's paradise. The market runs up. You're out very quickly. Comes down in G period again. The market, we've got B, C, D, E, H period comes down again, another fast thinker's trade. And the market runs. You get out very quickly. That's that's the 
what a fast thing that's how a fast thinker approaches the market now where does a fast thinker oh, I'm sorry fast where does the fast trader get in trouble when he really doesn't know who he is or she doesn't know they don't know who they are and if this goes down here they don't get out they say well uh, you know I think I'm right maybe I'll watch it for a while that is disastrous the fast trader you're in you're out the people asked me yesterday they thought you know as a slow trader wasn't there places for me to you know put on a short and I said I never saw it and they said well this was a pretty good move I said but I didn't see the potential and if you ask me to short where the, the trend is up value is higher these people that are looking for shorts when you have this situation you should be looking for a buying opportunity okay so that's the difference a slow thinker was here our slow trader was here fast traders were all along here and here now as we got closer into the day I'm going to collapse this now as we got closer to the end of the day remember I talked earlier about what I saw for the past couple days no elongation on the market when I see this that tells me at least in my opinion that what I'm looking at are momentum traders very short-term momentum traders so late in the session and I'll spread this back out again And for those that are part of our mastery program, or those that have been former or our members, we have been open for the last week to putting out two reports a day and also allowing uh, these people to see the chats throughout the day. And throughout the chat session, which is a one-way chat I can post, we identified some fast trades but then at the end of the day I said okay when the market looked up here it didn't elongate so as I'm looking at that I'm saying okay it didn't elongate more than likely I have momentum traders I don't have serious institutional money following and so this is probably fairly weak hands trading particularly when I'm looking at the exactness the more exactness it takes to bring buyers in the market the greater the odds are that those are weaker traders and traders that by well, weaker traders I mean they're not traders that have any intention of taking trades home overnight so late in the day as this market rallied in L period I also know that the wider the point of control is or at least the fairest price reading from left to right and this traded in many periods I know the greater the odds that price will get pulled back down to that level so the chat function was open and I then identified that I was engaging in a slow trade up here and that slow trade was to buy 2085 puts at 50 uh, 50 of five and a half handles or two hundred and seventy dollars a piece so on my slow trade because I had all day to think about this it's only the second trade I've engaged in all day then one of the things that is so important as a slow trader is know how to monitor for continuation so as a slow trader I need to leave an excess high up here I need to see the market start to elongate lower and I need to fairly easily get down below this G period low which was the pullback low during the day if after I engage in this trade and monitoring for continuation if in fact there is any I, I know I'm going to get some liquidation part of why I was counting on that this wasn't elongated that more than likely it was a lot of daytime frame traders a lot of daytime traders have to go home flat simply because they don't want the risk or their clearing firm don't doesn't allow them to take trades home overnight because they're not highly enough capitalized so I'm saying pretty good odds that these are 
weaker hands daytime frame trade will get some liquidation. But if I have any meaningful trade as my slow trade, I need to see evidence that it is the liquid. You're going to get the liquidation first, but I need to see evidence that it's a more potent short by longer term or institutional money also becoming joining in on the sell side. When this market came down, barely took out this area, and finally, you know, failed at this area. There's nothing in that trade. It was and I, I, another chat that went out that all we were looking at was liquidation. We did not see anything more than that. Okay. That's another thought of going through my head, a kind of a thought process as a value as a value trader. One of the things that we continually focus on is there's two personalities or emotions that you have to understand as a short-term trader. Yourself, the, your own emotions, as well as the emotions or the characteristics of the competing traders you are competing against. Just like I got up here say, okay, daytime frame trade is probably long. I get down here, if there's any real serious selling, the market's not going to have any trouble taking this out. Got down here, stopped on a dime, didn't take it. I know right away that the chances are I am simply looking at liquidation, not a combination of liquidation and new institutional selling. Remember, just getting liquidation can actually strengthen the market because it removes some of the weekend traders from the market. So there was one slow trade here that I saw yesterday, one slow trade here. All of these were what I would call fast traders. There's nothing wrong with fast trading. As long as you understand what you're doing, you have great discipline and you will exit that trade immediately if it doesn't work. Nothing wrong with that at all. Now, when we go through and do the intensives, you know, people a lot of times ask me, where would I get in, where would I get out? And I've said, you know, how irritating it is to, uh, you know, answer a question with a question. And when they ask me that question, I don't know their personality. I don't know what kind of trader they are. So there's, no, there's really no way to answer that question. Now, the worst thing that can happen, here's some of the things that go on. Somebody walks away from this webinar, and I think, well, really, that makes some sense. And they identify themselves as, let's say, as a fast trader. So now... They buy this G period low someplace in here, a couple ticks above the low. And what they should do is, as a fast trader, you get out very quickly. So they get out about where they should, someplace, you know, near the F period high. And then it goes on. They say, oh, boy, that was a mistake. I should have stayed with it. So the next time, you know, now they've forgotten that they're a fast trader. So the next time they stay with it and they get annihilated. It is so important that you identify who you are, what your personality. You do not turn a fast trade into a slow trade. Slow traders do not become fast traders. It's very easy to do. It's very easy to do. When you, when you start switching back and forth, the chances are you are going to confuse yourself and you're just going to be all over the place. And the odds of your success are very very small. The odds are small to begin with just because of the nature of the market. But you'll increase them greatly by being able to identify what is my personality? Am I a fast trader? Am I a slow trader? And at least start from there. If you decide to convert from a fast trader to, to a slow trader, from a slow trader to a fast trader, it should not be under the heat of battle. It should be something that some decision you've made when the market was closed and you sit down and you write your guidelines to make sure you know what rules you're going to abide by. All right. So, again, that's really what we're talking about. The references, the references for a fast trader are going to be a previous low, going to be half back like this line right here with the end period. The dark line right there is half back. Typical uh, fast trader reference, 
previous 30 minute high, previous high for the day, uh, the opening, the opening is always a fast track um, reference. But they, now, and the, the references that the fast track traders use are usually very visible. Everybody can see, can everybody can see it. It's not a mystery. The previous 30 minute low is not a mystery. Half back is not a mystery. It's a mathematical calculation. The overnight high, you know, the, the previous high, none of those are mysteries. So usually the, the references being used by a fast track trader are very, very visible. The, we always talk about monitoring for continuation. The biggest monitoring for continuation for a fast track trader is time. That trade should work very quickly. If you buy this G period, you know, when it failed to, to follow through below the BD period, and if that trade doesn't work very quickly, you should be out because the, the slower that trade worked, the greater the odds are it's going to turn around and extend to the downside. So time, we say time regulates all opportunities. Time regulates the fast track in a very much quicker manner than it does for the, uh, for the slow track. Decide what trader you are. Go with that and understand what you're doing and then see how it works for you. But understand why you're doing a trade. Understand who you are. Understand what your personality is. All right. I've done a lot of talking without taking any questions. Let me go back and see if we can open this up for um, um, some questions. Yes, we have a few. The period lows yesterday were close together in week, so it was really higher value and strength of the gap that dissuaded Jim from shorting. Um, you know, lots of the single A prints calling for a revisit. I guess that's a question, and the answer is yes. The short-term trend is up. The the yesterday value was higher. I had no interest in shorting, except I did as a slow trade late in the day. But during the day, you, you're thinking, so many people were looking, to, they, they get it in their head that if the market's this high, the best trade is to short it. When the market's up like this, your best trade is usually buying. You want to, you generally want to buy dips. Go with the value. Go with the tone of the day. Usually if there's a short on a day like this, it's there's two things that happen. Generally, one time on a day like this, you will get an inventory correction. And that invent one inventory correction took place in the G period. So I've been seventh period, a little over three hours in the day. You got an inventory correction. That inventory correction very often trips up a lot of people because they see it go down. They think there's momentum on the downside. And they're unable to recognize the difference between liquidation to balance short-term inventory versus some combination of liquidation and new money buying. As fat as, as by the time you extend in oh. G period, time you start to go down in G period, you're seven periods wide. It's very hard to get very far away from seven periods wide. The, the wider, it's been there for, you know, three and a half hours, it's pretty well identified what is considered to be the fairest price for the day. So the chances are that this is just liquidation uh, in here, okay? So again, you know, but a lot of traps come in. People say, oh boy, it's going to break, and they've been wanting to break all, they've been wanting to break all day because they saw it so much higher than the previous day. Boy, I just look for that trade opportunity to short it. And that's what's in their head, and that's what they've been trying to do all day long. Their mind is not very open. Where, you know, just go... The market's trading is so much easier if you go with the, the tone is up. The tone is up most of the time when it's like that. Your opportunities are going to be on the buy side. If there's a sell opportunity, it is usually a short-term sale to balance inventory or it's late in the day. Okay, other questions? Yes, I, I was uh, doing a, a few things bef while you were talking at the beginning, but a question has come up or a comment. The futures had very large volume at the end of the day. I think I heard you mention volume, but do you have a comment for him? Well, there was also very large volume on the on the composite for the New York Stock Exchange. 
And yeah, I did comment on volume. I showed where we were behind. We were behind by 500,000 going into the last, uh, the last part of the last 15, 20 minutes of the day. And we, uh, we exceeded uh, yesterday's volume by, uh, uh, by 100,000. Oh, yes, there was, whether it was options expiration that takes place on Wednesday, whether it was program, I don't know, but it was very heavy, heavy volume. Yes. Okay. Okay. Why do you feel that you cannot do both types of trading? It seems like a long, as long as you define the type of the trade up front and stick to it, any trade is allowable. You're... All I can tell you is that's something you have to decide for yourself. If you think you can do it, be my guest. From experience, from experience, I find it very unlikely that you can go back and forth with your personality that quickly. It's hard enough. If you think about just trading in itself, one, one time frame, one way of trading, how hard that is and how many different emotions creep in. You know, trying to filter that out and, and stay focused is extremely difficult. Trying to go back, oh, I'm going to do this, this, and more than likely, you'll chop yourself up. More than likely, you, your results will be unsatisfactory. If, and here's the, here's the basic question I address to everyone, okay? If what you're doing is successful, if you're doing that right now, back and forth, and it's successful, then don't listen to me. If what you're currently doing is not successful or not satisfactory, then listen to what somebody with experience is saying and at least at least give it some consideration. For example, I was talking about this this afternoon. One of the things that I found, I, I do some writing, and I found that if I was writing in the morning prior to trading, for some reason, writing takes a whole different mindset than does trading. I was unable to, to put down the writing and the type of thought that takes, put the, hit the switch, and become a trader. My trading was a, tremendously unsuccessful. I just couldn't make the transition. So I learned, I didn't know about that. If, if somebody would have told me that might happen, I would have thought they were crazy. And then I found out myself, not from anybody told me, I just found out myself from keeping a journal. I said, wow, there's a correlation. My trading's pretty poor. When I've been doing something on a very serious basis, a different brain power prior to the opening. So, I mean, sometimes you discover that the things that are the most valuable are the things you discover on your own, because then you have more confidence in what they're really about. Anyhow, it's, it's up to you, but start with Start with an inventory of how are you personally, how are you doing right now? If you're not doing well, think about how you might reorder your approach to the market. Okay, another couple questions. At what point would you advocate fading momentum? At what point would you advocate to go with momentum traders? Maybe late in the day to fade or early in the day to go with? <laughs> it's It's... Everything is like something I use all the time. Everything's a um, series of facts surrounded by other circumstances. I decided to go against the momentum today when I'm going to. Um, you want to collapse that time, yeah. Right? I was in that process. Okay, what helped me today? And in the chat, at one time I put out the, the chat, the market was up here in I period. And I put out a chat. Let's see if we can find that chat. That's not what I want.
Okay. Tremendous risk for longs. Three bounces off of yesterday's high. Short-term inventory is likely very long. If we don't break, this would be the third day in a row that momentum traders have gotten away with continual weak buying. That was at uh, 1044 my time. I'm three hours behind. 1051, the break followed very quickly. Uh, I have seldom experienced this much volatility. So let's go back over to today. And what I was looking at when I made that chat, I period had bounced off of, there was the fast trade, there was yesterday's high. Yesterday's high is a classic momentum buying price, very visible, comes down and it bounced, the G period had been down to it, one tick above it, one tick below it, rallied again. I period had been I three times. I period rallied back up here. And that's when I put the chat. I said, you know, it just smelled like it was right for, you know, a, a break. It's just the mechanical buying without getting the follow through just seemed to be excessive. And then, of course, the break occurred. At that time, I period had not been below, had not been below the yesterday's high. The break came very swiftly, and it took it out. So again, when you're talking about going against it, I was sitting there watching, and I say, the long inventory has got to be ridiculously long at this time. A bounce in G period, three bounces in I period. And again, I said the importance of understanding your own emotions as well as the characteristics of those you're trading against. And the greed, the, the, the panic buy of weaker chance trader every time it got down here. I said, this is probably getting to be excessive. And you got that break very quickly. So that was one time. Then when the market kept K and L period, K and L period, one tick below yesterday's low high again. Hold on. I'll be... I'm sorry, I had to go to mute. I was sneezing. You made it in time. Uh, when K and L down there, and I said, you know, that's it. I bought puts on the next rally up. And when I bought those puts, what I had in mind was a late break down to yesterday's pullback low. And that's exactly what happened. Went a little bit below it. But again, it's just, it's seeing how wide it is here and saying, okay, you know, the fairest price is here. Every time they buy these, they're going long at prices above the fairest price. So these traders, these momentum traders are getting long every time at prices above the, the fairest price of the day. The chances that they're going to have to liquidate prior to the close are very high. And particularly when, again, I didn't think, because volume had been declining all day, I didn't think that I didn't think that there was institutional money on the buy side. So I thought the chances of liquidation were going to be very good throughout the session. Now, this is, it's a slow trade, because I was thinking about the trade. I watched it for some period of time. Let me stop and, and do a commercial here. When we get into the Masters series on starting Monday, we do a evening report. We do an update in the morning. We generally do a hour and a half webinar, live webinar, half an hour before the opening and an hour through the opening to get traders oriented for the day. But then in order, in order to let you see is closely into my mind as I can possibly give you, I will put out chat comments throughout the, uh, throughout the session. And you saw, you just saw a couple of those. Well, they're not always right or wrong, but that's what I'm thinking at that point in, at that point in time. And what, we're, what I'm trying to do is to the best of my ability, 
share with you what I see. Now, the comments I make aren't just relative to my way of trading, which is slow trading. Yesterday, I identified what I saw as fast trades. And I'm not telling you where to get in or where to get out or where to put your stop. I'm saying this is an area that a fast trader would more than likely be interested. This is an area that a slow trader would be interested, as I said. You know, I telegraphed this one that I bought the puts and the price, which I don't like to do. Most traders, the biggest comment we get, most traders want to know how I think. They don't want to know what I'm doing. And, and I'm very much aware of that. But I'm trying to, we go through with these chat comments, and I'm trying to share with you the thoughts going through my head and what I'm seeing. And the basis behind it, if you had individual mentoring, it's extremely expensive. I don't think people get their money's worth out of it because even if everything you hear is correct, which, you know, there's always going to be errors, you just can't assimilate the knowledge that quickly. So by doing the chat day after day, hopefully we can, you know, share a way of thinking with you so you come away with something of value. Anyhow, enough of the commercial, but I wanted you, I wanted you to understand what we go through, and we're contrasting. We're always looking at value traders. We're always discussing momentum trading. One of the big differences between the intensives that we've done in the past and the mastery series that we're starting on Monday is a much greater recognition and incorporation of momentum trading. One of the things that I that I told people that when I retired, and you know I went to I went to, to Thailand and and I traveled some up in the uh, in the States and had a little encounter with a black bear, I reflected on what the trading had been. And it wasn't deliberate. It wasn't something I planned to do. It just kind of came to me. And one of the realizations was that we could, we could have done a better job and we could improve another program by making a better distinction between momentum trading, value trading, fast trading, slow trading, to understand that there are so many different appetites out there. And I wanted to be able to address many different appetites rather than just oriented, orient people towards the way I thought about the market. Okay, Julia, let's take three more questions and then we'll call it a session if that's okay. Sure thing. Is a fast trader, are fast traders suitable for futures only trading accounts? How about slow traders? Oh no! Fast trading is you know, you know you've got your uh, uh, you've got your very active stocks that you know um, it's fine it's fine I, I in fact I switch down sometimes I I haven't done it lately but you know I used to go and I was a pretty active trader in Apple and I've traded a couple of the others now the the concepts that we talk about are the same for any market. Now, they may vary. I mean, I use it on real estate. The time frame is, is much different, but the concepts are the same. Whether it's a stock, you know, I'm, I'm not going to trade a, a stock that doesn't move and doesn't have much volume. I, you know, I'm not going to attempt to do that. But from a trading standpoint, you know, a stock that has volatility to it, a future has volatility, those are all great examples. Matter of fact, what I suggest to and, and ETFs in my in retirement accounts, I trade uh, mainly when I'm doing um, equities. I'm basically doing the uh, the SSO and the SDS, which are double long and double short the S and P. You know, and and I'm, or uh, and I've recommended a lot of times to people that don't have the capital or don't want to trade futures, trade the spy. I mean, the spy is just a much smaller version. Uh, and, you know, I've got quite a, I don't know, some of you know the background, but the, the whole idea for the SPY originally was mine. When I was um, <laughs> senior executive vice president at the Chicago Board Options Exchange, I wanted to create an index of the stocks that we traded uh, on the exchange. And um, that turned in, was the OEX, and it turned into the SPY. And then my friend, Iris Riley, who unfortunately has left the world, uh, when he was at, uh, you know, one of the exchanges, um, they converted it into a uh, into an ETF. So you know, but it's it it's triggered off of you know it, it parallels the S and P's very closely. 
So there's many different vehicles you can use. Two more questions. What does balancing inventory really mean? Is it traders taking profits on short-term trades or what? It's a, actually a great question. Mm. And when I say a great question, it means your, your um, answer is going to be very long. Okay, there's a monthly bar. Remember, I just got done making a statement, and that statement was, any of the concepts I talk about are valid for any market, at least a market that has enough volume in it and activity, any market that is financial in nature, any time frame. So first of all, I start and I take a look at the monthly bar chart for the S&Ps. Right now, we look on the left here and you see a monthly trend that goes on for an extended period of time. What markets do, they go from trend to trading range or balance, back to trend or trend to trading range reversal. Markets very seldom go V-shaped. They very seldom go from bull to bear. So the market's trending higher on a monthly basis. You get a break, and usually when you see that break, that's a market that was ready to, to cave in. It just was too early. So there was, there was the break. Then the market rallied. That was almost, I think it was about a 4.999 break. Then the market moved sideways for several months, came back down again. You can see how it worked off that reference, the market moved sideways in for several months, then it reverted back to, to balance. Okay, That's on a very long-term basis. So this was a trading range or balance, very long. If you go to a weekly, okay, you'll get a different, here's a balance in here. You know, the market moves that, and then it breaks out of balance. You go to a daily and you'll see that you'll see the same the same thing it balances and it breaks out of balance or you go to 30 minute bars it does the same the same thing so markets go trend balance back to trend trend balance reverse balance the same as a trading range. it's just depending on your time frame that it can it can vary the two types of trades that we enjoy the most or recommend the most are, we say the two most important things are excess and balance. Excess marks the end of one auction and the beginning of another auction. So that's a change. Trading is about change. So if you get an excess high or an excess low, and then the market starts to trade in the other direction, you want to lean on an excess and go with the new direction. The other thing we, we say, and we see it far more often, is when a market trades out of balance. Trades out of balance, that's the start of a new auction. So you got two things you can have, and we talked about the balance trading rules before. So the market either looks above balance and fails, looks above balance and accelerates. You know, we have the same thing on the downside, or it remains in balance within the trading range. Again, it's just some of the way of thinking we use to keep centered on what is really going on in the marketplace. Okay, last question, please. Okay. Can you describe what characteristics you observed in today's market that indicated a volatile and dangerous environment for a slow trade? Oh, sure. Um, back, back and forth through the um, yesterday's high multiple times. And then it would it would run up to the high, and then it would run all the way down. I mean, it's just by observation. You know, it's not something that you have to write down. It's just so much of what goes on in the, in the market and is your ability to observe. You know, just just get in touch with the market. Say, wow, this thing is just it's just crazy. Up, up, down, up. Down. I mean, that's and back and forth through yesterday's open. Now, uh, yesterday's high, I'm sorry. Now, one of the things that made me want to buy these puts late in the day is anybody that's been around me knows that one of my favorite trades 
is when you re-exit or re-enter a previous range. So when this re-entered, and then when K and L, it just set right there. It looked very mechanical to me, and it's re-entered this so many times. If the market had confidence on the upside, you're, you may come back here once, but you're not going to do it several times. So it's again, it's just learning to observe, and you just see how far back and forth. And that's why I put the chat in the chat comment. I put out it, when it was trading up in this range. I put, I think I my words were dangerously long uh, positions. Let's see, is that chat still there? Um, I don't see it exactly, but I think it was, I think someplace in there that I said it was dangerously, uh, uh, dangerously long in there. I, I don't see it right now, but I'm pretty sure that was in there. But anyhow, that's the, it's just learning how to, how to think. All right, let me say thank you very much. If you do decide to join us, um, the, any of the Kickstart webinars we do, the seven, they are there for you to go back, and they're all recorded. They're for you to go back and review if you decide to, to join us and you think you need a, a little more background in order to be, you know, more up to date uh, as we go. But let me say thank you very, very much, and we would love to have you join us. All right. Well, thank you, Jim, and uh, thank you, everyone. Dave, we couldn't get to your question there, um, but if you want to shoot it to us in email... Yeah. Do you have one more question that's driving you crazy there, kid? Well, you know, this is what we do. So why not? Okay, if you're going to take it, thank you. A little off topic, but would you, but um, I would like your perspective. I hear a lot of trading educators say, quote, there, was, there were more buyers than sellers, so the market went up. We know this is not true because at the end of the day, the total sell volume equals total buy volume. What are your thoughts on this, please? Oh I, no, that, that is a that is a great a great question, and it and it's a question that that I talk about so often when I'll hear economists talk about markets, so they don't have a clue about markets, and they say, well, there's an equal number of buyers and sellers. That is not the question. That is not the question. The question is, who were the buyers? Who were the sellers? For example, in a bigger picture, General Motors is a long time frame producer of cars. If you and I buy a car to drive, at least during the period of the warranty, we are the long term buyers. So General Motors is the long term producer of the car. You and I are the long term buyer of the car. In between are, in this example, I just keep it simple, are the car dealers. The car dealers are short term participants in the market. What they want to do, they want to, they're a whole different time frame. They want to buy from General Motors and market up and sell it to you and I. Well, if we get a mismatch in that process, all of a sudden, the dealers, the, the General Motors has been selling these cars, the long-term producer, but the, the intermediate or the, sh the shorter-term time frame dealer gets backed up on inventory. You got a problem. Now, what are you going to see? The long-term producer can no longer sell as many cars so that we, we have a mismatch in the, in the producer and this long-term buyer and seller, and that's taken up by the middleman. In this case, we're just talking about one time frame. So it's not, it's not a question of a buyer for every seller and a seller for every buyer. It's the mismatch in time frames and it's you know man when you get that mismatch same thing that happened in the housing market you get that mismatch that's what is in, what is important and that's where the economists totally miss the complexity of a market and how a market really operates so it's that mismatch between long-term buyers and sellers that is relevant not the buyer for every seller etc anyhow that's a very short answer to that question, but that's really, it's a very interesting question, um, and it stumps a lot of people because they really don't know how to think it through. Once again, thank you very, very much. Bye now.
All right, great. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, everyone, for being here. We have the Kickstart webinar uploaded from 12 p.m. Eastern today, and that's at the training site, training.jdaltontrading.com, under webinars. That is a public page, so if you'd like to see it, it's there. And we will also have this recording posted to jdaltontrading.com under recorded webinars um, in about two hours. Okay, so thank you all for being here, being a part of the Mastery Series, and we wish you well. And if you're uh, with us for the Mastery Series, we will see you 9 a.m. Monday, May 1st. Uh, for the beginning of it all. So thank you again to everyone and thank you Jim. A really great presentation and uh, we'll be seeing you all soon. Okay, bye-bye.